So, we're going to do a little bit of a um, side study this morning based on Ephesians 5, verse 1. But if you open up your Bible to Ephesians 5, verse 1, uh, we're kicking off Ephesians 5, which is basically walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Remember, we know who we are in Christ from Ephesians chapters 1 through 3. Chapter 4, right, we went through some practical ways that we work out our faith, right? And we ended a couple of weeks ago with do not grieve the Holy Spirit, right? We can oppress him. We can suppress him. We can quench him by our sin, by our unbelief, right? And so, and so we grieve him, right? The Holy Spirit, God is himself lives in us when we come to know Jesus Christ, right, as our Savior. How great is that? And I think when we really steep on that and really know that God lives in us, it's going to change your life forever. It will change your life. It's not just that he's there as a deposit guaranteeing, which he is, that we'll see Jesus face to face. So much more. So much more right? Our guide, our counselor, our comforter. He illuminates the word of God. He teaches us all truth. He knows us more than we know ourselves. So, so much more. So much more. And so uh, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says this, therefore, and therefore is there to see why it's there for, what it had been there for, right? Which we had just talked about. He talked about do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Imitators means followers, it means disciples. Be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We are going to just camp on, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Okay, so he's talking to us as believers because we're the only ones to be children of God. We're in the family of God because we know Jesus as our Savior. And he tells us we need to be imitators. We need to imitate. We need to be followers. In other words, it's not just about being saved and doing anything you want. It's about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're going to look at in a little bit, uh, Luke 9 as well. But I want to just go through this for a second because Paul has concluded in um, Ephesians 4 where he described how Christians relate to one another, right? How we relate to one another. Now he's going into Ephesians 5 and he's tackling what kind of relationship you and I as a believer should have with the world. With the world. In other words, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. But we need to have a relationship with the world. They need to see Christ in us. Okay, the Holy Spirit in us. So he says, look, you need to be imitator of God. You need to be a follower. You need to be a disciple of God. I love how Paul said, um, imitate me as I'm, as I'm imitating Christ. Isn't that convicting? Imitate me as I'm following Jesus Christ, right? And so we need to be imitators of God. So the idea is simple, that we are to make God our example and our model, okay? However, you can only do that by being in his family, by knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, okay? We can't uh, content ourselves comparing us among men. We need to heed what it says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. It says this. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And how much of your conduct? All. And how much of your conduct? All. all. In all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you're set aside for his purpose. And you know that, and you want to follow hard after him. Notice it doesn't say... Think about God. Admire God. Adore God. I mean, those are all great things, okay, important Christian duties that we do. But it, it says what? It says imitate him. Imitate God, okay? This is a call to practical action. Practical action, okay? Going beyond our inner life with God. This is now our faith worked out so people can see. So people can see, okay, going beyond our salvation to discipleship. And so we could say it's a continuation of the same idea that Paul mentioned in Ephesians 4.13 regarding the extent of our Christian growth, which he said, 
to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's how we're supposed to grow up. To the measure, to the stature, to the fullness of Christ. We want to be filled to overflowing and be and imitate God. He also says in Ephesians 4.32, he commanded to what? To forgive one another just as God in Christ also forgave you. So think about this. God's behavior toward us, God's behavior towards us becomes our measure uh, of our behavior towards one another. How are you doing on that? How am I doing on that? God's behavior towards us becomes our measure of our behavior toward one another. We're supposed to imitate him. We're supposed to be holy, like he's holy, right? And it's important to see that God is far more than just our example, okay? A lot of times there's many errors uh, nowadays that come into, into the church when Jesus is presented only as an example of behavior. Like, oh, he was a really good teacher. Or, oh, look how he walked here. Look what he did. Oh, yes, he was a great example. But he's the son of God. He's the son of God. He's Jesus Christ. He's not just an example. Remember, we are not saved by the example of Jesus. Jesus went from his crib to his cross for you and me so we could have a relationship with him forever and then ascended so he could send another comforter, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, to live in us till we see him face to face so we could do what? So we could be an imitator of him. So we could be little Jesuses walking around this earth so other people would want to come to know him personally, passionately, powerfully, and preeminently. So be imitators of God as Dear children, if we are imitators of God as dear children, they will be compelled to recollect that there is a God, for they will see his character reflected in ours. I have heard of an atheist who said he could not get over, excuse me, I'll read it again. I have heard of an atheist who said he could get over every argument except the example of his godly mother. He could never answer that. It's the same thing with mine. The same thing with my mom. I could blame the church. I could blame this. I could see hypocrisy. I could do this. And then there was my mom. And I couldn't get over my mom because she was an imitator. She imitated God. And I wanted what she had. I wanted what she had. So we're going to go deeper into what it looks like to imitate God, to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, okay? And, and that's the reason we went through a time of going through and, and sharing about our excuses, because um, we make excuses, which we think are reasonable. We think, you know, that, I mean, you should understand this, Jesus, when we're not following so hard after him. So we're going to look today at Luke 9. Okay, I want you to turn to Luke 9. Uh, and I will read from, let's see, 57 to 62. And we're going to see how three potential Jesus followers, I call them potential Jesus followers, they each gave Jesus a reasonable excuse about following him. And then how Jesus challenged them on their initial gut reaction to him, okay? Because usually, ladies, the initial gut reaction is what comes to mind first, and it typically exposes what? Our heart, right? Our initial gut reaction usually exposes our heart. I call that our as is. Remember, it's what's inside already when life bumps into you that what? That spills out. When life bumps into you, it's what's inside already that spills out, okay? So you and I are faced with that exact same dilemma today in following Jesus. What we see as seemingly good, reasonable excuses are challenged by Jesus because of their superficial nature, because they mask our true desire. So I want you to understand 
through the reading of Luke 9, and as we dig into these three potential Jesus followers, that you can't follow Jesus. You can't be an imitator of God and run your own life. They're opposite ends of the spectrum. They're like oil and water. You can't follow Jesus. You can't be a disciple of his and run your own life. So uh, let me give you a little background what's going on before we dig into Luke 9. Let's talk about what Jesus and his disciples had been doing prior to this. Jesus had sent out his 12 disciples um, and had given them authority and power in his name to spread the good news, to share about the kingdom of God, uh, to share about Jesus, and to be able to heal the sick. So that had been going on as well as all kinds of miracles Jesus had been performing. Miracles mean it's a sign pointing to, and of course he was doing a lot of miracles to point to the fact that I'm deity, I'm the son of God. And so there are many miracles going on, one of which you know, was the feeding of the 5,000, okay, from a little boy's lunch that had five loaves and two fish, and he thanked God and he fed 5,000 plus women and children. And then uh, there was Jesus' transfiguration, right, on the Mount Transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John came up, up with him, and all of a sudden, Jesus is meeting with Elijah and Moses, who had been dead for a very long time, and they're like, ah, oh, Jesus, like, turns white as can be, and you couldn't even look at him because he just let his glory go, and whoo, transfiguration. So that had been happening, and then uh, Jesus turned to Peter and said, um, hey, Peter, who do people say that I am? Who, who do people, and Peter's like, well, some say, you know, you're a prophet, some say you're Moses, some say Elijah. No, no, okay. Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter said, oh, you are Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So that's what's been going on, and now Jesus and his disciples are walking together on the road from Galilee, they're departing from Galilee, and they're going toward Jerusalem, knowing that his time was fast approaching. Knowing that the cross was fast approaching. So let's read this with that in mind. Luke 9, 57 to 62. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but my first reaction when I was reading this and studying this was, yow, Jesus! I mean, it sounds a tad harsh here. I mean, you're Jesus. I know God is love. I get it. But I mean, you know, your responses to these three relatively reasonable excuses just seemed a tad abrasive to me. Right? It just seemed a little cold, a little unloving. And then as I kept reading and, and kept dwelling in the scripture, I realized I am similarly guilty of rationalizing my own behavior in the same ways as these three well-intentioned men. I do the same thing. I make excuses too. I do the same thing. I mean, Jesus confronts my excuses with the truth of my own behavior. Jesus confronts your excuses with the truth of your own behavior. And then I see that I tend to sidestep my personal responsibility in sacrifice. So we're going to go through each of these potential Jesus followers. And we're going to see how Jesus comforts, uh, not comforts, well, at times he does, confronts their excuses. He confronts their excuses with the truth of their own behavior. Okay, so let's look once again at 57 and 58. Let's read it again. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. 
And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So here's the first potential Jesus follower. And you know, I am sure that Jesus received many, many spontaneous offers like this guy. I mean, after all, he's been doing miracles. I mean, really, he's healing the dead, healing the sick, he's raising the dead, he's doing, you know, feeding 5,000. I mean, you know, wow, let's follow him, right? I'm sure he's getting many spontaneous offers like this, right? Due to the miracles associated with his ministry. I mean, how glamorous would that be to follow this guy around? Or so they thought. Or so they thought. And it would appear that this man sincerely desired to follow Jesus. But Jesus abruptly confronted his superficiality with the reality of what it would cost him to follow him. Of what it would cost him to follow him. A willingness to do what? To embrace hardship. Persecution. No guarantee of comfort. Notice Jesus didn't tell him that he couldn't follow him. He didn't say you can't follow me. He just told him the truth. Remember, we follow a crucified Christ. And it seems that this first potential Jesus follower turned away because the life that Jesus led was a very simple life by faith. He lived a simple life by faith, trusting his Father, trusting his Heavenly Father for every need. And that wasn't very appealing to this guy. So his excuse was, I want to follow you, Jesus, but on my terms. I want to follow you, Jesus, but on my terms. You ever said that to him? Perhaps some of you have spoken the same words. I will follow you wherever you go. Wherever you go, Jesus, like this first potential Jesus follower did. I mean, it sounds like it's the only right answer, right? I mean, it sounds like this is the only right answer. Proclaiming our steadfast love and our willingness to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow you, Jesus. But is that completely true? See, before we proclaim our willingness to follow Jesus wherever he would go, we'd be wise to count the cost. Just like my dad told me. You'd be wise to count the cost, Margo. What that means is, to count the cost means to consider how the consequences of that action or event will affect you. To consider how the consequences of that action or event will affect you. However, if you truly count the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to what? To absolutely want to imitate God. And then compare that to the price that Jesus paid on the cross for us for the forgiveness of our past present, and future sin, we soon realize what a priceless gift we've been given, and then it becomes a no-brainer to follow him. He's done it all for us. Let's go to the second guy in Luke 9, 59 and 60. Second potential Jesus follower. Then he said to another, follow me. Jesus said to him, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Notice the first potential Jesus follower offered to follow Jesus. This guy, Jesus, asked to follow him. So this guy was coming face to face with his priorities. And he's not torn between right and wrong. He's torn between right and right. He's torn between right and right. And again, the excuse provided isn't unreasonable. Lord, let me go first and bury my father. 
It's not unreasonable. So my first reaction to Jesus then is like, well, how can you rebuke a man who prioritizes family obligations? How can you do that? Aren't we called to love, protect, and provide for our families? Well, yeah, but let's go a little deeper and see what Jesus has for that message to us. So when Jesus responded, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Jesus pressed on that man, you need to follow me now. You need to follow me now. There may not be a then. You need to follow me now. And he clearly stated the principle that family obligations or any other obligation must not be put ahead of following Jesus. And our response reveals what comes first in our hearts, right? Eternally speaking, especially placing anything or anyone before God will always, always become a divisive wedge in our faith walk if we allow it. Always. And ladies, in no way is Jesus being insensitive to this potential follower's desire to bury his father. But prolonging or putting off a decision to follow Jesus assumes that we will have life and breath in the future to make such a decision. Jesus must come first. Prolonging or putting off a decision to follow Jesus assumes that we will have life and breath in the future to make such a decision. We need to follow Jesus now. Jesus must come first. But if our family becomes an idol in our hearts and draws us away from loving God first and foremost, foremost then we need to address our priorities. And Jesus reminds us, right? Our heart allegiance must be this if we're going to follow him. From Matthew 22, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, right? This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Did you notice how how Jesus wasn't concerned about perhaps discouraging potential disciples. Did you notice that? He's just laying it out there, right? He's not concerned about discouraging potential disciples, right? He was being honest, and he shared up front what it meant to follow him. So the second potential Jesus follower knew it was good to follow Jesus, okay, and he knew he should do it, but he felt there was a really good reason why he wasn't going to do it now. So his excuse is, I want to follow you, Jesus, but not just yet. Or I'll follow Jesus when I get around to it. I mean, I, I, mean, I want to follow you, Jesus, but not just yet. I'll follow you when I get around to it. So the first potential Jesus follower was too quick to follow Jesus. And the second guy is too slow because he offered to follow Jesus after an indefinite, perhaps, long delay. Let's go to the third guy. Okay, it's in uh, 9, Luke 9, 61 and 62. Here's the third and final potential Jesus follower. He says, and another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, this third potential Jesus follower offered to follow Jesus after a relatively short delay. A short delay, right? Again, his superficial request seems more than reasonable. Right? His little excuse, right? I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to my family back at my house. So he's already made a firm commitment. He says, I will follow you. I will follow you, Jesus. Okay. But I just want to take some time to say goodbye to my family. But now Jesus is questioning 
his hesitation because Jesus knows that the more time this man takes to reconsider his decision, the more likely he will abandon his decision altogether due to the influences around him. His wife, his kids, his co-workers, his neighbors, his mom, his dad. I mean, they could at least challenge his decision, right? I mean, uh, maybe they don't share his beliefs. They don't understand his rationale. That's why Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So Jesus is stressing to this man the commitment necessary to follow him using the analogy of the determination of a farmer plowing a field. Now you have to remember that this farmer didn't have a big John Deere tractor that was computerized to make straight rows for him, right? Like we do, okay? In the plowing in the field that day, he'd walk behind the plow, okay? And a farmer kept the rows straight by focusing on an object in front and then lining it up with an object in the distance like a tree. So he would make a straight path, a straight furrow, and he would have to hold on very tightly and keep his eyes fixed on that tree in the distance. See, if he looked over his shoulder, what would he be doing? Yeah, he'd be following and he'd be going all the wrong way. And, and, and there wouldn't be furrows to be able to put seed in, okay? So Jesus was sharing the likelihood that we are tempted to compromise our commitment to Jesus if those we love do not approve or support our decision is probable. It's probable. So in following him, we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. Fixed on him. There's one goal in life, to know Jesus personally and passionately and powerfully and preeminently. That means he's over our life. He's over our decisions, over our thoughts, over our career, over our ministry, over our family, over our finances. Right? He's over everything. We keep our eyes fixed on him. One goal and all the other goals flow out of that one goal of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. So somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. One goal. One goal, fixed on him, not looking behind, not listening to everybody else, your eyes fixed on him. So what's happening here is, I want you to understand, God is not condemning, Jesus is not condemning our family commitments, okay? He is challenging our priorities. If We allow anything or anyone to come before our commitment to love and serve him unconditionally. Like, what do we sing our song all the time? Right? He's the one who does. He's the one who sees us through it. He's the one who's got it. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of trust, and we must decide whose voice we prioritize most to fulfill our needs. So this man's excuse is, well, I want to follow you, Jesus, but I first got to fill in the blank. Or I'll follow you, Jesus, when I get my priorities in order. I'll follow you, Jesus, when I get my priorities in order. So all three of these potential Jesus followers relate to our what? Personal comforts, right? Our personal comforts of home and the responsibilities that we have with our families. What we cannot miss here is that Jesus is not condemning either of those, okay? He's not commanding us to abandon our families for the sake of the gospel. That wouldn't even be consistent with scripture because in 1 Timothy 5, 8 it says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it wouldn't even keep with scripture, okay? What he's doing here is Jesus is testing to what extent our true allegiance lies. 
He's testing. Where does your allegiance lie? Do you really want to imitate me? Do you really want to follow me? See, when Jesus gave this stern rebuke to his potential followers, he gave you and me an incredible favor by not painting a misleading picture of what true discipleship looks like. Right? Of what following hard after him looks like. Of what being an imitator of God looks like. Because, ladies, it's not just about salvation. That's the beginning. That's the start of us, becoming a child of God, right? It's not about just salvation and living any way that you want. The Christian life, being a follower of Jesus, starts with salvation. We have the Holy Spirit then, and then we're able to walk and be his disciple and listen and yield to him moment by moment by moment. It's the beginning of being a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, right? The old is gone, the new has come. I'm a new creation in Christ. That's a good, good thing. It's the start of becoming a follower, a disciple, an imitator of Jesus Christ. And Jesus wants us to count the cost. Just like he did. Just like he did. Because being a follower of Jesus Christ requires dying to self. Daily. Daily. It requires forgiving and serving others. It requires enduring ridicule. It requires suffering persecution. Just like Jesus did as he walked this earth preparing to go to the cross for you and me. And just think of all the eternal benefits that we will have, right, as a follower of Jesus Christ. Just think of that, okay? They far outweigh any temporary fears. They far outweigh any personal sacrifices we will ever endure. Far outweigh. Remember, we're supposed to live for the day, not today. It's about forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And ladies, I believe with my whole heart, if we lived like that, this world would be upside down for Jesus Christ. Upside down for him. If you notice, Jesus didn't respond to these three potential Jesus followers like this. Just follow your dreams. Oh, be true to yourself. I get it. You know, go with your gut. You know, you're a good person. I, I understand. Or this last one. As long as you're happy. Jesus didn't say that. This is what Jesus tells us out of Luke 9. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. More than anyone else, Jesus lived this. Jesus lived this. He steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem. It says it in verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Resolutely. He had his mind made up. And nobody and nothing could stop him going to the cross. I want to give you a, a personal example of mine. In, uh, I remember a time where, just like these three potential Jesus followers, when Jesus kindly confronted me uh, on the road of my life with all of my excuses. And I needed to personally count the cost of following him. Oh, I was saved. I mean, I was saved. I had the you know, gold ticket to heaven. I had to get out a free card from hell, but I was still trying to run my own life. And you can't follow Jesus and run your own life. 
Many of you know, like for 20 years, I was a principal in an ad agency in Milwaukee area. It was an exciting career. Every day was exciting. It was great pay. I loved it. I loved the people. I loved it too much. And I distinctly recall a time when God was placing on my heart that uh, I needed to leave the agency and to follow him. And he kindly reminded me that I, I uh, defined my image by the agency. I thought I had made it the millions that it is, that it was. I mean, after all, there are people coming to Jesus. I mean, look at that. He reminded me that I wasn't the Savior, that he is, and that uh, I needed to lay it down. And uh, he continued to tell me that, you know, Margot, I'm the one that gives you breath. I'm the one that gives you life. Uh, I'm the one who gives you the ability to make wealth, as it says in Deuteronomy 8. And so uh, I listened, but I kept questioning him. I kept giving him all my excuses, like the guys in Luke 9. Like that first excuse that he uses, well, I want to follow you, Jesus, but on my terms, I told him, you know, well, after all, you know, we're in the process of adoption. I mean, that's expensive. You are adopting our first child and this, this, and I mean, you know, I mean, I need to keep working and this and that, and Brian has a good career, and so we're going to have to keep, you know, having dual income, no kids, to so be able to be able to pay to have a kid and this, and so I'm telling him all these things that I, uh, I want to follow you, Jesus, but on my terms, it needs to be this way. Or like the second follower, potential follower, I said, well, I do want to follow you, Jesus, but, you know, not just yet. Not just yet, because, you know, I mean, I'm going up, up, up in my career. I mean, you can see that. I mean, you can understand that. I mean, and besides all the clients and the employees, I don't want to leave them in the lurch. I mean, what would they think? Or like the third guy, you know, I said, I will follow you, Jesus, but first I got to get my priorities in order. I mean, I have no doubt I will follow you. But, you know, let me just, like, uh, first finish up what I started here uh, with the agency, tie up all the loose strings, and, and then I'll get back to you. And so my badgering him for a year with all of these seemingly reasonable excuses kept piling up and piling up and piling up until one day I was seated in the great room and I was reading God's word and I was drinking a cup of coffee and I looked down at the lake and there was a mist over it. I took a sip of my coffee, I looked back down and the mist was gone. And immediately he dropped scripture into my heart. Margo, that's life. Life is like a mist. It's here today, and it's gone tomorrow. Did you see how fast that mist was gone? You had a sip of water, uh, coffee, and now it's gone. That's life. It's here today, and it's gone tomorrow. And I want you to pour into two things that will last forever. The word of God and people. And you'd think that that would have gotten me. But my last ditch effort of an excuse was to go to my engineer husband. Because I knew he'd say, oh, no, well, not right now. I mean, look at this, 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 look at all this. And to tell him what God had really been placing in my heart for quite a while. I mean, surely he would agree with me. Those are reasonable excuses, and I'll never, ever forget his first response. He said, well, Margo, you need to obey. I'm like, well, who taught you that? He said, you did. <laughs> of which I fell on my face and just started weeping. He said, Margo, God will provide. He's Jehovah Jireh. He can't do anything else but provide. He's the provider. He will provide. It may not be in the way we're accustomed to, but he will provide. And so I left, just like Abraham did. Just like Abraham did, not knowing where I was going. But I knew who I was following. I knew who I was following, and it didn't matter anymore what it would cost me. It didn't matter anymore what it would cost me. My eyes were like resolutely set on Jesus. And I remembered what it cost him.
to give me life and life to the full. You can't follow Jesus and run your own life. So let me ask you today. Are you a follower of Jesus? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about after salvation. Are you a follower of Jesus? Or are you a potential follower of Jesus like I was? You still giving him all the excuses? I mean, they seem reasonable. Jesus himself counted the cost. No excuses as he resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem as he came to do the will of the Father. We know that from Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, which says, We must keep our eyes on Jesus, who leads us and makes our faith complete. He endured the shame of being nailed to a cross because he knew that later on he would be glad he did. He counted the cost. He knew later on he'd be glad he did. Now he is seated at the right side of God's throne. So keep your mind on Jesus, who put up with many, many insults from sinners. Then you won't get discouraged and give up. So in closing this morning, I just have like a multiple choice kind of thing for you. It's like, let's have an honest, self-reflective time, just between you and Jesus. Like, choose one of these. Like, the first one is, you know, I want to follow you, Jesus, but on my terms. Or you say, I want to follow you, Jesus, but not just yet. Or you say, I want to follow you, Jesus, but first I got to get my priorities in order. Or maybe it's all of the above. Or maybe it's none of the above. I don't know where you are with Jesus this morning, and I don't know which one or ones you've chosen, maybe one, maybe all, but I do know that Jesus knows where you are with him, and that's a good, good thing. He's always drawing you in his loving kindness, and that's a good, good thing. He loves you, and he has your, his absolute best plan for you right now, right now, as you Imitate him as you follow hard after him, as you are his disciples. So, in closing, I just want to take some quiet time and have us pray quietly before him. But I want to encourage you to spend some time with Jesus this week. Just sitting with him. Just talking to him about this. And then listen. There's two things that will happen with conviction. One is that you'll embrace that, and it will change your life forever. The other is that you'll push it away, and it will harden your heart. And it will be harder the next time. And it will be harder the next time. So spend time with him. Sit with him. Talk with him. Be quiet with him. Ask him to speak to you. Walk with him. Maybe there's a special situation like, well, one of these excuses shows up. Confess it to him. Maybe there is a, you know, you can see God working in your life in a certain way here. Thank him. Thank him. Maybe you don't know where to start. Ask him. Ask him. He knows you through and through. He wants you to imitate him. He wants you to follow hard after him until you see him face to face. So let's close just with silent, silent prayer between you and Jesus, and then I'll close in prayer.
Lord, thank you for speaking today. Thank you for speaking to me once again. Help me to obey your word. Help me not to immediately run to excuses, but to run to you. Thank you for sharing that following you isn't a one-time event. It's a daily choice. And help us to daily, daily choose you, moment by moment. So, Lord, thank you for these three potential Jesus followers. Help us not to be potential Jesus followers. Help us to be disciples of you, followers of you, imitators of you, so others can see Jesus in and through us. What a purpose-filled life, Lord. Thank you that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. We have your word. We have your Holy Spirit living in us. We have each other as the body of Christ. Mm. And we have so much to look forward to, now and forever. And so, Lord, when we leave today, may we not forget what you have spoken to us. May we not just tuck it away in a corner, but may it continue to be right set before our eyes. We want to make it right with you. Whatever that is, Thank you for always being long-suffering and always waiting for us and always, always having your best plan for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.